Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Setter Tales Podcast. Uh, I'm Wade, and Thomas is back tonight. And uh, we uh, want to update you a little bit on some of the things that have been going on. The first thing is that I'm very uh, uh, happy to report that Thomas has been named the uh, Iowa Mentor of the Year uh, by the Pass It On Outdoors Adventure uh, uh, organization, and that is that what they are? There you go. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and it's it's uh, it's um, it's an honor that he really deserves because uh, Thomas puts a lot of time and effort into the kids and the youth and getting them outdoors. And sometimes that's not an easy task. Any of us who have hunted with some. Uh, newcomers to the sport who are handling shotguns in the field and over dogs and our dogs and and trying to make sure that everybody has a great time while by, but while doing it safely sometimes that can be more challenging than other days and it takes the right temperament and a lot of patience and he has those things and so congratulations i appreciate uh, it that's that's really awesome uh to to hear that and so uh um you can check out a little more about that on our on our webpage. We've got some postings up for for Thomas on that. So, the other thing Steph, is, you know what, to, to kind of chime in there, Steph knew that I had that award when she was here on our podcast. She kept it to her, she kept it to herself. Uh, well, man, I wonder how she did that. <laughs> the other so thing, like, the like, other the other thing for everybody that hunts in the Midwest, and our guests can probably even tell you what this was like. Um, a week ago, we had uh, a blizzard here where we're sitting right now, and <laughs> it was it was pretty wild. It was uh, brutal, brutal. We had snow and 45, 50 mile an hour winds. It lasted about two days straight, and uh, and honestly, I thought you know the hunting was probably going to be uh, pretty rough with drifts and other things. Now a week later, today it was what 57 degrees out. I mean, it's just nuts. Yeah, I power washed kennels and. And actually rinse kennels down with water today and, and disinfectant and it was like and I I went for a short hunt and uh and the birds are they're still like, What in the heck just happened? Because they're sitting still like it's nasty cold and it's kinda nice. Well, and that so. was a big concern I had is I'm glad it only lasted a few days because I I'm afraid that that would have had a big effect on the on the wild bird population mm -hmm. here, you know, and, and that, the drifts and the extreme cold and wind that we were having for those two days, that would have been devastating, I think. So luckily, uh, the snow's disappearing and we've got some warmer temps and hopefully uh, they've been able to weather weather through that, we, we hope. Well, I guess we'll see in the spring. But The good thing that had happened was the wind blew when it snowed, so it just piled it up. The fields are pretty well exposed. I hunted, I think Saturday, I walked outside and uh, I was like, well, it's cold. It's negative four or something. I thought, but sun's shining. I might just go walk the trees behind the house with a dog. And I got about three quarters away to the kennel and I thought, nope, my mustache is already froze. I'm going back in the house. But I did well, go this... Sunday in the cold um, and and uh, I went Monday and the birds were actually that that I did harvest. Their crops were just stuffed full, mm. like you could. It was you could see their feathers were spread apart. They were wow. they had prepared. There was enough food out there that, I mean, it made a mess when you cut them open because there's corn and beans and seed everywhere. So they were prepared. I mean, I shot birds Monday that we got. I think we got four inches of snow Monday after the it was kind of the cleanup. It was nice and. And there was, those birds were still underneath the snow hiding, like, okay, is this over? Is this over? But Yeah, so so if any of you had some experiences <clears throat> like that um, while bird hunting during those few days, uh, we'd love to hear about yeah. what uh, what you saw and, and how the birds are doing and what, what you're seeing now that the uh, temperatures have warmed up. Um, this is episode 30, which is amazing that we're, you know, we're at, episode 30 already it doesn't seem like that's that's possible but uh but it is and this episode tonight as as our previous episodes is sponsored by our good friends at kinetic uh, performance dog food and uh, we'll give them a shout out tonight um and then i think we want to get right into the the meat of of what we're here to talk about tonight our guest tonight is kyle warren and kyle is the owner of paint river uh, setters um He's up in Michigan. He's uh, 
he's a grouse hunter, loves grouse. Anything you want to know about grouse hunting, he's the guy that can tell us. Uh, but he's really spent a lot of time uh, breeding uh, Llewellyns and hunting them. And, uh, you know, we hope tonight to learn a little more about the Llewellyn strain. A lot of people get confused about that. So we're going to kind of drill down a little bit about what, what is a Llewellyn versus, uh, you know, a regular English setter. Um, and how that all came to be in that in that uh, development and history. And then we're going to talk about his comprehensive training program that he has, which is really unique, where he takes these dogs that he's going to keep in his program, and he has a, uh, has a year where he assesses them, gets them on wild birds, and basically he's looking for those dogs that are going to be added to his uh, future breeding program, and that's how he produces some of these really excellent dogs. So we're going to bring him in right now. Kyle, how are you doing tonight? Very good. Thank you for having me, Wade. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to come on, and uh, we, we'd love to talk to guys that are, are broadcasting or talking to us from what appears to be a dog uh, a dog kennel or a dog <laughs> building there in the background. Yep, that's uh, yep, that's, that's yeah, terrific. We're, we're, uh, I'm sitting in uh, what we're referring to as the bunkhouse of the, of the kennel. Um, okay. I sleep in uh, I sleep in my kennel usually six months out of the year that I have puppies. So that's pretty much from November, December ish until uh, late spring. So I'm um, trying to uh, make accommodations out here a little more comfortable for myself. <laughs> so well, it looks uh, good from what I can see of yeah, it. It looks pretty pretty, pretty pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, now you were up you're up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right? Is that where you're? Yep, yeah, yeah. In located? the Western UP. Yeah. Okay. And uh, from what I understand, and I've never done it, but from what I understand, that is like that is like the hot spot for grouse hunters. I mean, if you're going to grouse hunt in the Midwest, most of the guys I know of that have, have been grouse hunting, that's usually where they're they're heading up there around you yeah. somewhere up in there. You area. know, for the I mean, I guess the the heart of what I would call the grouse belt, you know, is. Um, northern lower michigan across the upper peninsula northern wisconsin and into minnesota you know so certainly that's uh what i refer to as the grouse the grouse bell obviously you get up into maine and uh the northeast and new hampshire and even vermont and places you know bird numbers are still pretty strong um yeah. but uh certainly in the upper midwest here we we have the vast contiguous habitat that uh is very beneficial obviously I know that um, a little bit of your background, we want to kind of talk about Llewellyn specifically, and sure. uh, we'll get into that. But I think what's important is to kind of get a little more background. I know that you started breeding dogs or being around dog breeding, I think, as a very young man, as if I'm if I've read, if I'm. Correct. Yeah, I mean, if uh, you know, I guess the the chronological highlight reel, you know, <laughs> in a nutshell is uh, my, I had three of my aunts that were professional breeders. Uh, one of them bred uh, labs and German shore hares. Um, so I grew up around them, um, got my hands on a lot of them. Our first bird dog in my household um, was uh, my father's shore hare when I was 10. And we belonged to a really nice uh, small bird dog club of 20 guys. We leased a thousand acre pig farm and uh, there were grouse on on that farm, um, but we released pheasants and chuckers, and you know that's kind of where I developed my passion for seeing the dogs work, and and uh, certainly my passion for <laughs> for grouse and their uh, um, and all and all their awe. But um, uh, so I had short hairs. Uh, then I moved on to Vishlas, you know, when I was a little later on in my teens. I had my own personal dogs. Had a couple Britneys, uh, and then kind of fast forwarding to uh, my early 20s, um, I got into Llewellyn's um, and uh, haven't looked back from Sutter since. <laughs> well, that's kind of happened to all of us, happened to be. I, you know, I didn't have, I had other breeds of dogs before I had Setters, but once I, once I got my hands on a Setter and, and was exposed to that for the first time, I, I got hooked as well. And I think that's kind of a common common story that you hear from from a lot of sure. us. Um, one of the other things too was your search and rescue experience. I you know I know that 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 factors into some of the other things that you do now, which we'll get to. But but uh, you spent some time training dogs for search and rescue, 
utilizing, you know, scent tracks and those kinds of things. And um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, one of my aunts also bred shepherds for almost 30 years. And, um, I, you know, I, I've been a career dog trainer since I was 16 years old. I'm, I'm now 42. And um, uh, so I've trained a lot of shepherds, uh, to say the least. Uh, in my early 20s, I um, uh, started to get more involved in uh, canine search and rescue. I actually was breeding, I bred shepherds for a decade, um, kind of in the middle of my Llewellyn and my, my setter career. And um, uh, I had wilderness area search dogs, which are dogs that basically look for humans the way that our bird dogs often do, um, you know, when scenting the wind and air currents. Uh, I had a scent discriminant tracking trailing dog um, where you give them a scent article of somebody specific and they'll follow that trail, whether it's 15 minutes old or 40 hours old. Um, and then uh, the wilderness area search dog is cross trained in cadaver and then can also have cadaver only dogs. Since a lot of search missions, you don't know if the person's um, alive or, or not. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess uh, in summary, what I took away from my uh, time in doing canine search and rescue was that we took a, um, you know, when we're hunting with our dogs, we're looking for a, like a one to three pound bird, right? That's tucked in understory, you know, and uh, uh, we, we, we've seen, you know, uh, without any scent theory and behavior education, how weather can affect that and whatnot. So now take, take your scent source um, and magnify that to a hundred to 300 pound individual. Okay. And then have them, uh, in all different weather types and patterns, all different times of the year, sitting out for all different lengths of time. And it, it just magnifies the scent picture that you get to witness as a handler and seeing the dog read these scent pictures. And a lot of these scent pictures exist within our bird hunting we just might not be as attuned to it um, because it's on such a more micro scale, but it's all information. It's all Intel, Intel to, to read your dog classically, um, especially where you guys are, where you can hunt the wind. Um, everybody knows the classic scent cone, you know? Um, so, but we also have trail scent, which is ground scent that could be very fresh from seconds old to hours old. Um, and depending upon the, style dog that you have um i kind of break them down into tracking or true dogs you can certainly hear me talk about that ad nauseum on other podcasts as well um that i've done in the past uh, and i'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the llewellyn strain um and kind of why i've clung to them uh over the last two decades but um yeah we have scent cones we have uh, uh, uh tracking trailing scent we have lofting scent, uh, we have scent pools, we have scent traps, and understanding all of these types of scent pictures um, kind of allows you to read your dog better um, when you're out there. Um, certainly, um, you know, in your type of environment, in terms of maybe more open country, uh, you're gonna have a lot more scent cones and, um, and you'll still have, you know, tracks obviously when the dogs get on tracks. Um, from running birds, um, you probably don't get too many scent pools. Whereas up here in the North Woods, uh, where we have a tremendous amount of tree cover and canopy and shaded areas that are very moist, you know, birds sitting in trees for 14 hours a, a night, um, these create different kind of scent pictures than you guys experience at large, you know, down where you are in open country. So, so in the North Woods, you get you get the the, and we have a high humidity uh, content here versus, we'll say, further out west. Scent compositions based on moisture quality and content. So that's going to influence scenting conditions and the types of scent pictures that are available. So being in the upper Midwest, um, hunting in the woods, we, we have literally every kind of scent picture imaginable. Um, and it's, it means a lot to be able to uh, read the dog and and uh you know and sometimes also uh you know how how i train for certain scent pictures particularly our scent pools up here 
um, just to further educate the dogs and when we transition to wild birds, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're already bird dogs. They just got to learn the same thing applies to that new odor. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And that's, yeah, I'd like to kind of, we'll get maybe a little more into that when we talk about the Llewellyns and, and how sure. they utilize those, those scents, but let's, um, you know, when somebody says, what's a Llewellyn or, you know, do you have a Llewellyn? I mean, I've been asked that before, is that a Llewellyn setter? And, and, uh, so what, what is the best way to define that? Uh, you know, when somebody asks mm -hmm. you, what's a Llewellyn setter? Yeah. So well, how, how, best, how do you respond way, to that? The best way to define it is if you don't have a lot of time, just say it's an English setter. Okay. <laughs> so which um, is what i do <laughs> yeah yeah so um that's uh that's what i do but for for um you know defining a llewellyn setter um i guess firstly the the only organization in the world at present uh that recognizes them is the a field dog stud book um as their own breed though ukc which bought field dog stud book last year um is in the process of um, accepting the Llewellyn setter as their own breed. So I hear, um, and pretty much is going to follow in line out of respect for field dog stud book. Um, the, the same guidelines that make them such, um, you know, uh, Purcell Llewellyn, uh, never considered his dogs, a Llewellyn, its own strain, you know, obviously had his own family of dogs. He had his own kennel. Uh, Americans fancied them, you know, the majority of the Llewellyns were in this country, you know, uh, for the last 80 to hundred years, uh, in terms of population of our gene pool. Um, so they, they did very well in field trials back then. They were, you know, most English setters, um, had Llewellyn blood in them, you know, back in those days. Um, and then um, there were enough Llewellyn enthusiasts, um, including people within Phil Dog Stud Book, that were able to get them um, registered as their own separate breed from the English setter. Um, the Field Dog Stud Book, you know, considers uh, going back to um, some of the founding dogs, um, which includes a dog specifically named Rogue, who was not English setter at all, um, but was. Um, uh, half Gordon setter and, and, uh, half a uh, dog that's now extinct called the South Esk. Um, and that, uh, uh, that female robe, you know, um, was the sire to several other founding dogs, um, that was crossed in with the lab rack, uh, line of English setters. And pretty much you had to be coming from those dogs in order to be Llewellyn and not deviate outside those lines at the time that field dog stud book had made those parameters. So that's been a good thing and a bad thing. Um, you know, uh, as with all purebred dogs, we have closed, uh, gene pools. So ultimately, you know, we're all, we're all on the slow process to inbreeding our dogs and always trying to find out crosses with the, uh, less common, uh, breeds such as the Llewellyn. Um, and, uh, we've had a couple catastrophic losses in terms of chunks of the gene pool over the years. Um, we had uh, Al King's kennel from the Field Dog Stud Book that uh, unfortunately, that was a massive percentage of the gene pool that got taken, uh, taken out of Field Dog Stud Book uh, for uh, some discrepancies or miscommunications. Um, and, um, you know, like every, every uh, breed of working dogs out there, when you, each kennel kind of gets uh you know their their hot dog their hot stud dog you know and we get um popular sire issues right so every every kennel that has a superstar you know breeds every female in that kennel and any kennel around you know to that male and you know then uh 15 years later 20 years later 50 percent of the population has that dog within three generations of the pedigree you know which which of course everybody wants but in terms of population genetics that's not a good thing at all so we have a lot of that within the llewellyn line um, because they were already kind of cut off from the english setter gene pool at large um, to be a llewellyn interestingly um, within field dog stud book um, you can breed i could breed one of my registered llewellyns to your registered english setter and those puppies can be registered they will be registered as english setters and those offspring um that are Llewellyn English setter 
uh, we'll say crossbreeds, if you will, um, any offspring from them going forward, no matter how many Llewellyns you breed it to with field dog stud book, they then thereafter are considered English setters. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a purity element that, um, you know, is uh, the name of the game with Llewellyns. Um, they are uh, at, a, at a point that uh, certainly in my lifetime, we should still be able to breed healthy Llewellyns for the most part, but it's going to be waning in my child's, my children's lifetime. Um, the Llewellyn today uh, will not exist, um, you know, uh, when they're uh, in their latter years, for sure, unless some drastic things are, are done. And the technology is there. I do advanced genetic testing with Embark. Um, there's another organization um, that uh, works through uh, uh, UC Davis, um, the university out in California. Um, so there, there, there are breeders that are active in trying to do the right thing. Um, it's hard though to get, uh, you know, 20 dog breeders in the same room and get them all to have the same agreed <laughs> same opinion. vision. Yeah, yeah I'm sure right? it is. Um, so, so, uh, so when you talk, have, when, so when you okay. mention a cross, then you're talking about going outside the, the Llewellyn or could that just be out to another breeder or another line of, of Llewellyn's? Yeah. Well, so, so for me personally, um, you and I had talked before the show and we can get into this uh, later on or now, even, you know, I've mentioned about my Italian dog that I imported, you know, so in, in my almost 20 years of being married to Llewellyn, um, uh, they fit me best for a couple of reasons. Um, one of those reasons uh, was that they've actually, uh, in more recent years, in the last 50, 60 years, probably they've, they've been far less active um, in field trial circuits. And a lot of um, respected Llewellyn setter breeders have just been wild bird hunters. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't done both wild bird hunting and the trialing circuits. Um, and as the, the desire and the type of dog has kind of evolved and changed over the century, you know, of field trials, um, the Llewellyns haven't really changed with that time. Um, so, you know, I'm not a trial guy and, and I don't, I do not speak from experience here, but you see, you know, you see a lot of English pointers that are trialing today. You, you see a, these you know, bigger running dogs um, that are trialing in Llewellyn's while way back when they were, you know, a bigger running dog and covered ground. And that's what Llewellyn, you know, had intended. As soon as they came to the U.S., they uh, immediately became, you know, the foot hunter's dog, Al King, who um, uh, has a, a, a very much a roller coaster history within the Llewellyn setter breed but uh, for many years was a very respected breeder. Um, you know, I remember on his website when I was 20 years old, you know, looking at websites and stuff, he was, uh, it would say, you know, like my, you know, foot hunting dogs, what, like my grandpa used to have, you know, and um, percentage wise, statistically, uh, Llewellyn's are a foot hunting dog that are of close to medium range. Now, in the time that I've had Llewellyn's, certainly in the last 10 years or so, I would say that um, more and more Llewellyn breeders are trying to breed Llewellyn's to be more like, you know, field bred English setters. Um, it's not a bad thing, I guess, but uh, uh, it's, it's not the direction for me personally. Um, for what I like, I like those dogs that grandpa used to have. <laughs> and um, right, right. Uh, what I've, what I, what, became very attractive to me in terms of the style of hunting that I enjoy and found most effective for the hunting that I do is um, most Llewellyn breeders, um, they didn't care how the dog got the job done as long as it did it well, you know? And by that, I mean, we talk about um, the types of bird dogs there are. I had mentioned earlier a true dog or a tracking dog, and I, I, always break down bird dogs into one of those two categories and there are subcategories within them. But I guess in summary, a true dog is a dog that runs with a high head all the time is always checking air currents, never puts its nose on the ground prior to the shot. Um, a good recovery dog, every dog will put his nose to the ground to find a, 
a wounded bird, you know. Um, but the, then there's tracking style dogs, which find 50% or more of their birds by ground scent, you know. So they're a dog that runs with a lower head, with their head between their shoulders and their elbows. They're getting both air current and ground scent. And, um, you know, depending upon the nose potency and the caution within that dog, um, you know, they could smell uh, trails literally six or eight hours old. Okay. Um, and you learn to read your dog through its tracking language, its body language, um, as to, uh, you know, how close you are to that bird and, you know, the series of uh, stalking and pointing um, and leapfrogging that the handler and the, and the dog do. Um, to me, that's, that's real hunting. And, and that's, that's what keeps me doing this every day, you know, all day long, every season since I was 10 years old, but the Llewellyn line specifically within the setters has a, a relatively high percentage compared to a lot of other pointing breeds, um, has a pretty high percentage of that particular, um, type of dog because they've been away from the American trial and test world for so long, because our whole testing system in this country is based on a true dog model. We want a dog that, uh, uh, a term that makes my ears bleed is, um, an honest dog. Okay. You know, dogs don't lie. <laughs> um, you know, just, they might not be telling you what you want to hear. Okay. Um, you know, a dog that's tracking is clues. It's clue. You know, my dog's on a track. It's a clue. I'm reading the by language. I know what's going on. You know, um, a good percent of time, this leads to a bird. Sometimes the trail goes cold, you know, that's just, that's hunting. Um, but uh, we've bred, we're, we're, we've been breeding dogs as a country for, for the honest dog, for the true dog, you know, that dog goes on point and nine out of 10 times there's a bird on the other end of that dog's nose, you know, and so that's what our testing and trial systems have, have focused on, whereas that's not what all wild bird hunting um, people that are breeders um, have necessarily focused on. So the Llewellyn has a good number of tracking style uh, dogs and bloodlines, um, because of that separation from the trial world for the last, you know, say 50, 60 years or whatnot. Um, and those are the dogs that I tend to fancy. Uh, it's hard to create a family of just tracking dogs because again, you need, you know, inbreeding is always a concern with an all purebred dogs with all working dogs is always breeding back to, to our better dogs and stuff. But, um, uh, you know, I, I can say that between me and a uh, gentleman that, that, you know, Chewy Garcia, and we literally have and owned all the Llewellyn blood in the world. Literally, that's not a, that's not an exaggerated statement, you know? And so, you know, we've assessed, tested and trialed, you know, to our own standards, you know, what, what we like. And, um, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't personally have anywhere else to go um, for within the Llewellyn line to maintain the selection process that I've had for um, uh, for my tracking style dogs. So that's what brought me uh, to, um, uh, it's been five years research in the process, but uh, I finally, first COVID stopped me and then Putin went crazy, but I, uh, I, I managed late summer to get over to um, Italy, northern Italy, and uh, see a bunch of setters work in the Alps. Um, and uh, over in Europe, the European model, they, they greatly value tracking still uh, within, their, within their setters. Um, so for me personally, while I love the Llewellyn and I'll breed Field Dog Stubbook Llewellyns as long as I can breed healthy ones, um, you know, my own legacy for my dogs, for my kids with my dogs, um, is the type of dog that I have worked to create and come to love and find to be highly effective, um, uh, on wild birds. And that's my tracking style dog. So I'm, I'm more than content to calling my dogs, English setters in the long run, um, to maintain the dogs. And I'll always have probably a lot of Llewellyn blood in there. Um, but like I said, I needed to expand outside of that, uh, circle and, um, to find, good quality tracking style setters um, with what I have already here and accumulated and selected for over the last 20 years, that meant having to go to Europe to do so. You know, you, 
that is uh you know what what your program is is kind of a, a breath of fresh air to me and and i've been in the labs and i've been in to uh the coon dogs and and you know ultimately went back to the setters you know i did my research i knew what i had in the past and i thought you know i like you know we have a difference of i like a dog that's um and wade can attest to this i like a dog that's you know, I bring in a little bit of the field. I like a lot of the field in there, but I figured if I if they have that go when they're babies, I can always reel them back in. And you know, and we're you know when we're hunting, it's thick and heavy, tall cover. You know, a lot. You know, I can tell when I get into pine trees, those dogs, their noses are up, and you know, even when it's dry, if there's birds in them trees, and lately I've been finding a lot of birds in pine trees because of the weather, but their nose is up and. I just think they never miss. It's like, there's mm -hmm. not a blank there. There wasn't a bird there, you know, when it's dry, you know, I can see if you don't have a tracking dog, uh, you know, that's primarily more a nose on the ground, that those dogs that are pulling off scent cone are, are smelling where that bird sat the longest. And mm -hmm. then they're stopping. And then they're not picking up, okay, that bird took off running. Um, the wet snow today, I noticed I had a young dog out and you could see fresh tracks. He'd stopped where he'd smelled a bird, but you could see where tracks. He didn't think to put his nose down, you know. And yeah. and uh, but he put his nose in the wind, and he he ran along. And then he he did end up pinning the bird and did a great job at it. But um, mm -hmm. you know, you 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 kind of mentioned a couple of things way back in the day. They may have bred in some Gordon setters or or some different. Is that where the variety of colors that I see in the Llewellyn lines? Is that kind of where that kind of comes in from that gene pool? Or I just see you know, um, a lot of the setters. I, I mean, I, are... I guess, uh, you know, uh, so you go back, whatever, 150 years, right? And you have, you know, while you, you've had uh, several different breeds of setters, there was a lot of interbreeding, you know, uh, mm -hmm. between them before, like, you know, stud books got set up and were trying to do some very meticulous rec record keeping, I guess I'd say, but um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, when I was over in Europe, uh, I was actually surprised at the variety of color that I saw. I mean, I saw chestnut tricolors over there and uh, you know, I was, I was, su I was surprised, but again, there's probably you go back in those pedigrees again, Europeans never called them Llewellyns, you know, mm -hmm. but th those dogs very well could have, Llewellyn blood in them, you know, um, just they haven't been mixed with my Llewellyn blood in a hundred, 120 years, you know? So, um, you know, it's interesting, but I, I mean, I've seen the colors, uh, across the board. I, um, you see more, uh, within the Llewellyn versus the, the, um, field bread setter in this country, you see a lot more, uh, darker dogs within the Llewellyn, you mm -hmm. know, like, you know, percentage of their body that is black. But again, I also think that that is because Llewellyns are so much not a part of the field trial world. And within the field trial world, they want a white dog. So they select for that also, you know, mm -hmm. so for 100, 140 years, Americans have been selecting that are in the trial circuit selecting for a white dog. I personally don't want a white dog. You want to come up here and hunt from the end of October until the season closes down. You're not going to see your dog unless you got to wear in some kind of dress, you know? So, um, I like a dog that's 50, 50 black and white, you know, um, if I'm going to pick on aesthetics, you know, the snow, I can grab the black and the, you know, early season, maybe I can grab the white, but in the North woods, the truth is you can be on top of your dog and not know they're there <laughs> sometimes because it's so thick. Um, yeah, we, we but, have that uh, same issue in the grass yeah. here. <laughs> you know, because one of the, yeah, when you I'm get sure. back, when you get back to talking about the, the true and the and the tracker, um, I mean, Thomas and I spend the majority of our time hunting pheasants, and as you know, the pheasant wants to run. You know, mm -hmm. they are just runners, 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 and so the good pheasant dogs, for the most part, are are good tracking dogs. I think, but yeah, uh, sure. But now in my kennel, I have a, a I have a female that is your, I mean, she is strictly uh, Adeline. I'd say she's a tracking dog all pretty much all the way through, mm -hmm. uh, but by her style, by her range, 
and she, she's getting older now, so she doesn't move like she once did. And what's kind of amazing to watch is she'll get on a track and the other dogs are, you know, working out ahead of us and she'll get on a track and she'll stay on it. And eventually, uh, as, as you well know, those other dogs in their quartering will come across maybe that track farther out, you know, a, a few more yards out from where, where she is, but it's, it's the same bird. It's just that she's working it, you know, and eventually yeah. she probably would, would catch up to it or at least get it in gun range if yeah, it, yeah. she didn't have another dog that came in ahead of her and, and, mm -hmm. and yeah. punched her, I guess is a good term for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, my dogs, um, you know, in the grouse woods, I, I talk to Chewy all the time, you know, and he's sending me videos and photos of three dogs on the ground, four dogs on the ground. And that's just an anxiety attack for me up here. You know, it's, you know, your, your best, it, it's very hard to have a good grouse brace of dogs up here because, the dogs can't see each other, you know, so one right. dog's on point, you know, and it's, as soon as that dog goes on point, the bird knows it's been had. So if it's not in really thick, good tucked in cover, it's going to run, um, you know, and, you know, just for safety and awareness, obviously you want the other dog to be stopped too. And they got to dovetail with each other as much as they check in with you. But I've had my fair share of very good braces over the years. And the best races are one tracking dog running with the true dog. And, and that true dog, you know, if you run them in braces a lot, they learn to use that tracker as Intel, uh, in the woods, you know, I, I'll have, I'll have them pass, pass once, pass twice, come back. They see it, they make a 90 and they just go 60, 70 yards ahead. And, you know, beep, dog on point, GPS goes off, tracking dog comes up and honors that dog. But the other thing that happens a lot, and this is where, you know, taking, taking my scent theory and behavior knowledge from my search and rescue background and having owned both a tremendous number of true dogs and a tremendous number of tracking dogs um, in my hunting career is running both those, running two high quality dogs together, a true and a tracker on the same day, the same hunt, same condition, same bird. You really get to see where the dogs fill in the blanks with each other. And so I just described where the true dog, again, yeah, as to use your words, poached, poached that bird from the tracker. Um, you know, that's an intelligent thing to do and, and it works it's fine. Um, the tracker's never upset, you know, um, they're fine with getting an honor there. I find, I find the tracking dog always is a great honor. He always has a great, he's oh, always yeah. a great backing dog because he gets <laughs> yeah. a lot of, a lot of practice yeah. at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I can tell you happens in the Northwoods probably more than in your country is um that true dog is cast and now you guys where you hunt further out west you can hunt according to wind i've never hunted grouse a day in my life according to wind because it changes every 10 to 30 feet in the grouse woods Interesting. you know um so if you try to hunt according to wind you're just wasting your time and uh you're better off just looking at your map if it's a familiar cover knowing you're covered know how to clear your area well based on how your dog works. And um, so I've had plenty of times with the true dogs casting through the woods back and forth, um, trackers tracking. And where we are, the wind is, we're, we're going with the wind, okay? Um, and it just happens to be that's the way the wind is blowing at that time. <laughs> the true dog runs 20 yards in front of us, keeps going that way, tracker goes, you know, right up you know, and gets maybe five yards past where that true dog just ran and boom, sets right there. I walk 10 yards ahead of that dog and flush the bird and shoot it. Um, because the tracker, when it's on a track, it, you could have 50 mile an hour winds blowing the direction the bird is running and you could be following in that direction and the dog's going to find that bird. Um, so that happens all the time in the grouse woods. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, it's different. We've, we've bred dogs to be the way that they are. Um, and you know, you might get a lot of hate mail. I might get a lot of hate mail for this next statement. Um, but all apex predators hunt via tracking, you know, they locate their prey by tracking, you know, apex predators are such because they're considered at the top of the food chain because of their intelligence and their hunt ability, you know, so I feel when we have selected in this country for dogs that only run with a high head, we've dubbed them down. We've taken away part of some of their instinctive intelligence 
And I feel I see that in my dogs. I have uh, to date right now, I actually in, in my kennel, I only have one true dog here. And I've had some amazing true, true dogs. They're honest dogs. They, they handle their birds well. They still check in often. Um, they work well with other dogs. Um, but uh, it's not a coincidence that that uh, nine out of the 10 dogs that I have here are tracking dogs. You know, as, you know, if you have a dog that is incredibly intelligent, uh, human centric and cautious, I don't care what species it is, whether I've hunted it or not, likely not, you know, um, those dogs can handle. Cause I get that question asked all the time. Oh, I see you hunt all the time and all day long. And you know, you put a lot of effort in dogs and you're very passionate, but I hunt this species, you know, could your dogs handle that? And I said, well, there's, you know, I always try to be as honest as I can. Uh, you know, a good percentage of my dogs are as I intend them to be, but no, nobody gets a hundred percent of what they want, you know, in a litter. Um, but an intelligent, cautious dog can handle any wild bird. Mm -hmm. It just has to have the brains. I've never, ever washed a dog out based on nose, uh, potency. Never. One of the best dogs I have has one of the weakest nose I've ever had, but she's one of the smartest dogs, super cautious works with me great and a dog with a lower nose potency in the scheme of how dogs can smell is still adequate <laughs> to find and locate a bird. Um, you know, I actually run her with uh, another tracking dog that is my coldest nose to steal term from the coonhound world, you know, mm -hmm. uh, my most potent nose. Um, so like on a hundred yard track or 150 yard track, um, Missy, my, my most potent nose dog, she might, she might point, 15 times, you know, stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. As I'm going up alongside her in the heel position, as she's creeping up that track. Omimi, my lower potency nose dog goes up honors Missy. You know, she, she knows she's tracking. She doesn't smell anything because her nose isn't as good, you know, and she goes up and how do I know the different nose potencies of the dogs? Well, I'm a pigeon guy. Um, so, you know, you put pigeons out. I put pigeons out all day long in my fields during training season and stuff. And, uh, you know, as the birds are getting ejected, I'm picking up the launchers. Well, obviously, there's still old scent there. So you get dogs that are super, super cautious. I mean, mega cautious. And, um, you know, they don't even acknowledge that scent. And then you get other dogs that lock up, lock up on six-hour-old six scent until you get there. And by the time you get there, they've processed it. And then when you get there, they move, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we see, we see these differences uh, in the dogs. And your true-style dogs um they uh they're just looking for that hot scent they're looking for that scent cone you know and um you know a good tracking dog my dogs what also i like about the llewellyns uh not all of them again llewellyn now is as i as diversified in 2022 as as um any other line of english setter is today you can find llewellyns that run a thousand yards you know in open country you know the bulk of mine uh, running solo, you know, will be 80 to 150 yards, you know, in open country, you know, if they're braced with a bigger running dog from a younger age, they might go 300 yards kind of thing. But, um, you can find thousand yard trial type Llewellyn's, uh, today. And, and more and more people are breeding for that, uh, bigger, bigger running dog, um, uh, than, than what I look for. But what I like about the Llewellyn or my guys, and I, and I won't breed a dog that doesn't do this is uh, when my dogs are 15, 20 yards or more off the bird, they're standing tall. You know, um, if uh, they come across a scent cone and that bird is close proximity, they'll hit the deck and drop like a stone to the ground. You know, if we're on a track and it's an older trail, they're standing tall. As we get closer to that bird, the profile of that dog gets lower and lower and lower. That's all intel. That's information to me. Uh, especially in an area where I'm getting poked in the eye every three seconds, you know, and using my gun as a shield as I'm going through alders and hazel and aspen whips and stuff. Um, so I can try to pick my shooting lanes as I'm looking for holes in the sky, you know, in the canopy. And, um, and I enjoy it, you know, to me, that's, I feel like I'm hunting, you know, and again, I have, I've, I've had many great quality true dogs. They handle the birds really well. You got to be very specific as to how you handle uh, them to clear your areas, make sure that you're not missing birds. Okay. Um, that's a, a huge, 
thing that I feel is the big biggest disconnect in the bird dog world is people dogs have amazing noses, but people wildly overestimate their dog's ability to smell a bird, you know? So, <clears throat> you know, in the grouse woods, I'm always telling everybody the, the average distance of a productive point on a grouse is five to 15 yards. The reason why is that distance is because that's how far, you know, scent is free flowing through mm -hmm. the majority of the season that we're hunting it. Whereas maybe you go out to Montana where I've never been, you know, and maybe the average point with the five mile an hour wind is 50 yards, you know? Um, but you need to know, you need to learn to your experience and be attentive to what these distances are. And today's with technology, I run my dog silent on a Garmin. You know, I can see their tracks and stuff. I know what holes I have in my, in my uh, hunt area, you know? So I think that's the biggest disconnect um, with a lot of people is they overestimate their dog's nose ability with understanding um, how scent moves um, and what's available to their dog. You've got a dog with the best nose in the world. I've had, I've had 250 pound men in t-shirts and a short sitting in heavy brush uh, mountain laurel that we have back East a lot. Um, and as part of a certification for search and rescue dogs, and we got an 80 pound shepherd that is highly proficient at his job. And we have to grid through this uh, mountain laurel, this 30 acre heavy brush. And this guy's been sitting there for four hours, emitting scent. Humans shed a hundred dead skin cells a minute. And this dog go right by him just based on the conditions and the environment, you know, and miss them after four hours. The average bird hunter would think that if they go through an area and they grid it, they're going to find one pound scent source and all that junk, you know, and that's not necessarily true. There's so many variables at play. Yeah. I hunted today and in this afternoon and just for a short time and had a young, young dog that he's not a big goer. He's just kind of a la da 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 and then boom, you know, he's got one, but I, I did see birds fly into this area and that's why I walked out there and, and he got one right away and thought, oh, well, that's good. And, you know, he did his job and did good. And then walked through him like, there were more birds. They're not running in the snow. So I literally just, there was no wind. I mean, it was dead calm and I walked back through and on the other side of this 80 yard wide path and he went right down the line and got two more. So it's like, I get what you're saying there, you know, and, yeah. and people don't understand that, you know, up here it's, it makes it difficult because it is windy all the time. Yeah, and yeah, especially if, when you have it those and, days where it's gusting and, it, and it, yeah. we've got square sections here. So. Yeah you know, you're going to have to get in there and hunt without the wind, you mm -hmm. know, with the wind at your back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, usually you just got to figure out how to loop around and, and zigzag back. But with something, you know, as far as your breeding, and I know you're, you're very specific on, you know, you know, what you're breeding, you know, the male, you know, he has probably has a stronger point than the female. And then if you mix them together, you might get that. Maybe that's not your way, but like when you're picking out a puppy, this is, I figured that I think this would be a good, important thing to ask you, you know, the way I do it may be different. The way Wade does it may be different. You know, I'd let them get that natural ability out until we get them into the field. They know what they're doing, let that natural ability, and then work around each of those points as far as training, you know, you got to get them so they can come to you so you can catch them. But what, you know, how do you start a dog that you want to stick in your breeding program yeah. And, so and... I guess, um, I guess my process, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a black sheep, I think, uh, when it comes to, I'm not hard on puppies at all, but I'm, but I, I do believe that since we've been breeding these dogs for hundreds of years to point birds and find birds that a puppy that is put in the absolute most opportune situation to thrive with seeing hundreds of pigeons and hundreds and hundreds of wild birds in its first season. If that dog is intelligent, has a nose, has basic obedience and has had all those contacts, you should know by the time the dog's a year old, if it's, if it's a breeding quality dog or not, mm -hmm. you know? So, so for me, um, you know, uh, I, with within the Llewellyn pool, there have certainly been times when 
I have to make compromises like with the true dog element, you know, so just because our pool is only so big and I have to say you're, 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 you got a great temperament, you handle your birds really well, you're close to medium range dog, you know, uh, you're a good retriever, you're healthy and you know, uh, you're a true dog. All right. You know what? I need those genetics. Uh, I'll select what I can from there and hope that I get a, a tracking style dog. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, my puppy process, you know, when I looked five years ago or so, when I looked in my kennel, I had 14, 14 dogs in my home and, um, I'm like, all right, well, you know, this, uh, this year, uh, I had my 102nd Llewellyn that I've raised from eight weeks old through its first hunt season myself, uh, in 20 years. So, um, so I've raised a lot of dogs myself. I've bred several hundred, but I've raised that many myself between, um, mostly what I've purchased from various breeders around the country and, uh, certainly from my own stock as well. Um, but when I look, you know, a handful of years ago at all the dogs that were sitting in front of me and I couldn't be happier with, with that squad, you know, I'm like, all right, what do you guys all have in common when you were little, <laughs> you know, what, what was the common denominator here? You know, um, obviously they all were very much selected, you know, multi-generational sense. And, you know, a lot of the dogs, including through several breeders that I did not own, you know, I've hunted over more than six generations of the dogs that I have now. And I'm three generations deep into my own of just my own. Um, but I, you know, I had, uh, and I've always had hunting dogs and I've always been a trainer. I've always been type A and very, you know, math and list oriented. So I have like a 30 point checklist, you know, you know, when 20 years old going through all these things. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. Yes. And, and like five or six years ago, I was like, well, what do you guys all got in common? You're the best that I've ever seen and had. So, so I start thinking about it and some of them I have records on, you know, I'm looking at their little charts and stuff and ultimately it came down to very few traits you know, that they all had in common. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, probably the most gray area, is just that intelligent eye, you know, the, the dog that, you know, when you look into the puppy that when you look in their eyes, you know, I always think of like, that, like, it's like a well, you know, like you're looking into their soul. They're not looking at you, you know, uh, the, the dogs that have the laser penetrating eyes, they're not for me. Um, the other thing, um, from four weeks, eight weeks old, I get them in a playpen and I sit on a playpen with them uh, for an hour, uh, three times a day. I want a puppy that's as interested in hanging out with me as it is with its litter mates. So, um, so a human centric dog is a dog's probably more likely to gonna want to work for you, you know? So, so that was a big trait. Um, and then, um, you know, not that I see within my dogs a lot of extremes in terms of like the extreme bully that wants to beat everybody up or the one that's shaking in the corner. Um, but obviously one with the average and even kill temperament. And then lastly, what I have found to become one of the most important traits, because there's a lot of genetic linkage to it, I feel, is retrieving. Um, you know, setters by design initially weren't retrievers. Today, many setters retrieve very well, um, uh, just through encouragement uh, and what people have selected for in their breeding programs. But I, what I have found is, um, you know, uh, a pup that wants to retrieve, you know, they've had toys, I've been playing with them. And then at seven weeks old, I take my little rolled up, rolled up rag. I take them, I isolate them for the first time ever, you know, away from their litter mates, just me and them and this one toy they've never seen before. And I can throw that back and forth, you know, and they go out, get it, bring it back, you know, and then how they bring it back, you know, they're playing keep away for a while, you know, are they coming close and teasing me with it? Are they coming back with their ears pinned against their head saying, is this what you want? Is this okay? There are all these little nuances in how they retrieve um, and if they retrieve. And, uh, and I'll do that for like three days and I'll do that twice a day for three days because sometimes uh, the, one of the pups, you know, on, on day one, first attempt, just watches you throw it 10 times, you know, and it doesn't go after it all. But by that third day, you can't tell the difference between that puppy and the other one that's been going after that toy, the, you know, every single little retrieving session. So the, the combination of that, those handful of markers for me 
Um, in addition to, I, I, I do the embarked genetic testing for DNA COI uh, specifically um, as what I'm looking for in that test. Um, those are all my first layers of cutting, if you will, for my selection process. Um, and then from every breeding season, I, I keep the ones, you know, that um, I like, uh, like that, or I place them in homes that uh, are, um, you know, within my program and raise them up. They see between 100 and 200 pigeons, depending upon the time of year, uh, between uh, April and uh, September 1st. Um, and uh, I'm doing basic obedience. I get them collar condition, whether the puppy is five months old or whether the dog is five years old. I'm a minimalist when it comes to obedience, but what I demand of my five-year-old, I also demand of my five-month-old. I will mm -hmm. not walk in. I will not start a hunting season with a dog that I can't stop reliably with a woe on the fly. Um, that's crucial to me. Um, puppies bump birds, you know, it's a learning process. Um, but I'm a firm believer. I mean, you know, I, I have a almost four year old and uh, five and a half year old daughters. They're in school already. They're learning. There's rules, you know, um, you know, so I have these dogs that I'm selecting for, you know, an intense point instinct that has a lot of caution, good retrieve ability, desire to hunt with their human. I do all the basic obedience um, and I make sure that they are well trained. I don't, all my dogs break on the flush. I don't, I don't steady them uh, past the flush. They all break on the flush. Um, but they all have to stop when I say, well, and they all have to come when called and they all have to walk on a leash and they all do that impeccably well by the time they're five months old. So when they're in there in the woods and they're 10 to 40 yards ahead of me and I can or can't see them, if I hear a bird go up, I can shout, whoa, they stop. I get up there. I walk around. I can release them. If it's a wild flush in close proximity, I can shout, whoa. If I see them bump the bird, I can shout, whoa. So I'm always ensuring a successful contact, you know, meaning that the dog took away from that experience what I want them to take away from it, you know. Um, and the dogs that are more intelligent, more cautious, you know, have a lot of point. I don't have to do that 10 times, you know, yeah. and, and they're doing it, you know, so my dogs see hundreds of contacts in a season. I mean, I, I hunted our season ended two weeks ago up here with, with the uh, winter weather, but um, you know, I still hunted 90 days this season and my first year dogs hunt 80 plus days. And, you know, they get in that amount of hunting, they get to see hundreds of wild birds, you know? So, but I usually know who the superstars are within 50 birds. You know, yeah. um, based on the genetic potential, you know. Well, that's pretty, uh, pretty cool. And, uh, well, we're kind of getting close to wrapping up. Uh, there's so many other things I'd like to talk to you about. Um, we have to have a part Well, two. yeah, I, I, we, we hope that you would be interested in coming back and doing another episode with us maybe sure. in the future. Because Certainly. I think there's a lot of things about the training techniques that you're using and some of the other things that we didn't get a chance to get into tonight that I think would really be uh, fun to discuss and, and, and things that we could learn, learn from that, from some of the successes that you, you obviously have had. We kind of try to wrap up every episode we, we do uh, with a favorite dog story and everybody has one. Now you've had so many dogs. I don't know if you can <laughs> find, you could pick one out of all, all the dogs that you've had, but, but there's probably that one, Maybe it's the dog that kind of set you on this journey, you know, many years ago. I don't know. But what's that? If somebody said, what's your favorite dog story, Kyle? What would it, what comes to mind uh, yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. you would, uh, you would talk about? Yeah. Well, um, I, uh, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you one really short answer and then I'll give you a better story. But I guess the, the theme for me that, that will keep me doing this as long as I can is with the tracking style dogs, you know, and I, I hunt in some very thick, thick brush. I'm not a trail hunter. We get in there real deep and we get in the nasty stuff. And, you know, uh, it's those 11th hour hunts where the, the dogs have been doing great. You know, you could put up 10 birds and the bird gets up five yards in front of you routinely and you, you never get a shot at it because you can't get your gun up. You can't stand up straight. You can't swing your gun. You know, um, just you were walking while the bird went up, you know, or just you can, might not even seen the bird, you know. So 
so that happens a lot. So certainly when we have these 11th hour hunts where you've gotten into a bunch of birds, no opportunities, the dog's on this epic track, you know, 100 yards, 300 yards, and and it's hammering down the sets, you know, their belly's hitting the hitting the ground. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's always, uh, and then, you know, the bird goes up, it's like a swing around shot, you know, feel like it's like you just kick the winning field goal in overtime of the Super Bowl, you know, but the, the story that I would, uh, say that, I, that I, that I often like to share with people is my dog Duncan several years back, gosh, probably five or six years back now. Um, he's one of the best grouse dogs that I've, I've ever had the opportunity to hunt with. And, um, we were in New York, we were in some abandoned farmland type of classic New England grouse cover. And, um, uh, he was up on the hillside. I could see him. He was just on the upside of a huge briar thicket, um, going into an orchard where there's a lot of hawthorn and, uh, kind of very classic grouse scene. So he's locked up. I can see him and I'm down the hill and near a stream and I'm looking up at him and, you know, he's hop skipping a jump up there 60 yards away from me, you know, and locked tight and i'm trying to get there trying to calculate which way to go and so i finally decide that all right i'm gonna go this way so i start going up that way and i look up the hill and i could still see that spot where he was and he's not there anymore and uh i look down and he's back at me and he got right in front of me and he just from where i was stalked walking in front of me looking over his shoulder to me and brought me back in that direction and when he got we got within like 30 yards of that area he went right back to where he was on point he locked up he waited for me to get there as soon as i stepped in front of him from where he originally locked up he tracked ahead and we had a series of tracking uh tracking points and we ended up getting that bird like 10 minutes later you know off of a track but leaving that leaving that spot because i was taking like a super long time to get there and guiding me back there, going back. All right, this is where I had it last, Dad. And that's pretty amazing. And that was, uh, you know, that was that was a, a pretty exceptional experience for me. I got lots of fascinating stories. Um, uh, birds getting shot and taken out of midair by hawks that were sitting in trees you know, from behind <laughs> you, and all kinds. That's of pretty cool, stories. though. The dog that but, does the pathfinder thing to come to get yeah. you to say, "Here's here's where you need to come." Where the yeah. heck have you been? This. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, sure. hey. It, it's been it's been delightful Absolute talking to pleasure. you for the this this hour went so fast and we appreciate you taking the time and uh Anytime. we love we love hearing hearing about your your dogs and what you're doing up there in the woods i've never tried it i'd really like to um i might be getting on in the years where maybe that window is closed a little bit for me but he might uh, be a trail guy <laughs> but <laughs> yeah i might be looking for that logging road that might be my grouse well, hunting experience but yeah. But, I can uh, point yeah. you in. I can point you in some general direction where 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 you it might not be uh, quite as uh, brutal, and the birds might be slightly more cooperative, but you'll still get the full experience. Yeah, well, that's that we might need. be what I'd need. But uh, but anyway, we'd love to have you back uh, here in the near future, and we'll talk about some other uh, uh, parts of your training stuff because there's just so much material to cover it. We can't get it all in tonight, but. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, thank uh, you. Very welcome. Uh, thank you. We'll uh, we'll we'll get back to you and and. Uh, and uh, talk to you again soon. Appreciate it. Okay. And, uh, you know, that was a great, I mean, yeah. uh, that was some great information and we'd like, we'll, we'll get, we'll get Kyle back for a future episode or two, uh, just because there's so much there, but yeah. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. It's one of our things when we, when we, when we sign out, we always want you to do, it helps us with the numbers, leave reviews, tell us what you like, what you don't like, all that stuff. But, uh, as Thomas is back here to say, instead of me, keep their nose in the wind. And you do that. See you next time.